Um, all right, Coach. Uh, just I guess kind of first is kind of an opening statement about uh, this past weekend, and then I guess kind of talk about the the uh, the exciting uh, fifteen to twelve win yesterday. For me, Nate, um, I spent a lot of time just being thankful that we were playing. Um, you know, as the, the the pause that we've had in competition, even when we opened up at Kansas State, I just was like, please let this happen. And it did, and, and then we lost a series. And then I did the same thing for Cincinnati. And I just wanted to know that it, COVID was at least maybe on a leash to the point where it would allow the conference season to play out. So once we got there, I was just relieved that we were gonna compete. Um, you know, and then we were, I shared with Colin last week that you know, with a couple of guys out that are really important to our team, we were just trying to figure out how to hold service um, and fight and get out of there with a couple of wins. Uh, maybe more if it happened, but w without Sikorsky and without Dunn, and nobody likes to hear it, everybody just looks at the scores, and I get that. Um, we had to make some adjustments, and some guys really stepped up. So I was super, super proud, maybe more – I was so proud yesterday um, of the resiliency that was demonstrated by our guys and that at 0-9, everybody's uncomfortable. The food's horrible. You don't sleep well. Um, your wife hides from you. There's just a lot going on at 0-9. And when we lost that lead the ninth, uh, for our guys not to give up and, and to take that game was, I thought, an incredible statement. Yeah, I would agree. That was a big show of character by your team. And, and Billy, talk about some of the plays that were made in extra innings to keep that thing going so you had a chance to pull it out. And Ball State had a lot of scoring opportunities that didn't work out for them you, because the Broncos were making plays. Yeah, we were, Robin. And, you know, we've got, we've got a team that could potentially defend extremely well. And we've just been making some – just unexplainable throwing mistakes and um, from guys that they don't, they don't even know how to explain it right now, but it was on full display yesterday. Um, and, you know, normally I keep notes on the scorecard of, you know, things that we did well and things we need to improve on. And, and you go over those with, with the guys after the game and try to finish on a positive note. After five and a half hour game, I was not going to go through that card. <laughs> One, I didn't think I could stand any longer, and two, I knew they didn't want to listen to me. But you know, just a single one guy out. I, th I thought Drew Devine made some game saving plays. The double play up the middle, game over if he doesn't turn that. The the full sprawled out line drive that he caught. Um, some of the plays on the run. That turf was extremely fast. And um, he was, you know, you need to be good up the middle. And that's why we felt so good going in with him and McIntyre at second base and Dunn in center field. But, but you need good defense and good pitching to win, as we've seen that in the past. And yesterday was you needed good defense and you needed to keep hitting the ball out of the yard to win. But, Robin, no, I, I was jaw-dropping defensive plays. The, the diving catch that Connor Sharping made in left field over his shoulder, that could have saved the game without a question. Uh, you could go on and on and on with these plays. I thought Greg Budig made an incredible catch on just a, a little, you know, outs were a premium. You just, you couldn't give extra outs yesterday. And Greg Budig, who, who out of the nine hole, hit a couple major home runs, made a, a sliding catch bobbling. Their, their team made a couple of really good defense. It was a great game. And really, nobody deserved to lose, but I'm glad the Broncos won. Coach, is that a sign that your team has some power, or is that just a sign that Ball State has a tiny little baseball field that they play in? Well, that, that park was playing small yesterday. It played like Ebbets Field on, on Friday because the wind was blowing in 20 miles an hour, and John Baker had his way with us. Um, and then Saturday, the park, Robin, actually played kind of normal. Yesterday, it, it did play small, but it didn't, it didn't play as small as it has been. That was, a, it was more like a 10 to 12 mile an hour win. I've been there where it's been 20, where 
there's been fly balls and your infielders will go back like they might have a chance to make a play on and it goes out of the park. It wasn't that bad yesterday. I would say that most of those home runs, if not all of them, were probably home runs most days. But we do have some power, Robin. Um, I, I can't get the home run that Sean O'Keefe hit out of my mind, even though Morrison's two-run home run to create that three-run cushion and to follow up Divine giving us the lead again in the 14th inning there. But the ball O'Keefe hit, <laughs> you know, wasn't like a, a rocket ship. It was like an F-18 exploding out of a runway, and the thing went over the hitter's eye. And I don't know if you could see that through the webcam or whatever, but it was just an absolute scud missile that was climbing going over the hitter's eye. Um, and the park got really quiet on that one. Um, but Robin, yeah, we, we, we put on some power display. We were able to do that at Kansas State. Not making excuses, but we have seen some good pitching. And then when I thought we would hit, we haven't. Um, we just haven't been able to put the thing together, but yesterday was special and I hope that it's contagious and that that energy kind of catapults us into another higher level of, of, uh, performance and competition and, and victory. Go ahead, Colin. <laughs> Coach, you mentioned, uh, how good the defense was at times yesterday, obviously, um, you know, it's been up and down this year, both the defense and pitching, um, you know, in this series, you had two games where you allowed two and three runs. And then two others were allowed 12 and 13. Um, what do you think it takes to get that, you know, to a more consistent basis where, where you feel more confident that that six, seven runs wins you a ball game? That was kind of the plan, Colin. And you follow us closely. And, and I appreciate that you do and how knowledgeable you are of our roster. Because the scores, you look at them and, and they're not reflective of what you think sometimes. And then, you know, you, you get frustrated and we go out and we give up two runs or three runs and can't win. And we give up two runs Friday and can't win. And then we give up 12 and we, and we do win. Um, the co number one, just confidence. Confidence, uh, guys continuing to get to play and get some reps and get out there and get some feel. I'm, I'll give you an example. I put Ryan Watt in Saturday. And I have as much confidence in him as a freshman pitcher, maybe of anybody that I've ever coached with the exception of Keegan Aiken. And he went out and threw four straight balls and he wants late game action. He, he's asking for that. And he would have broken the state record in Indiana for saves in a career for his high school had he not lost his senior season. So he likes, he likes the back end. He, he's got a very short memory and he likes the action and, um, so I went back to him yesterday and showed him that I had confidence in him and, and he went five innings. And I think he gave up just three hits, something like that, and, and he, he battled. Um, but I will tell you this, Colin, I, I, I would like to have Easton Sikorsky back in the rotation. I think that kind of aligns us better. And I would like to have Blake Dunn back in center field, but right now we don't. So we just have to kind of keep, I've heard Robin say it, it's really a next man up. And, um, I thought Will Mullen was incredible, incredible all weekend in a gutsy performance on Sunday. You know, he throws sidearm, so he recovers a lot more. You know, he, he recovers quicker than most guys because I'm cautious not to injure players, and I don't want them to have a warrior mentality and end up injuring themselves. So it's a fine line that you got to be careful with protecting somebody's arm. But it's just – we just got to keep playing, Colin. We just have to keep playing. And confidence is a weird thing. You know, when you don't have it, it's really hard to win. And when you do have it, sometimes it's hard to lose. And I, I smelled some things yesterday. I, I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't surprised at what I was seeing. I was just thankful. I was energized. I, was, I felt blessed to watch a team that I coach fight like that yesterday. That was just an exhibit of incredible fortitude and resiliency and, and never giving up. And I told the guys before the game that every game is like gold in conference. And you don't know that if by winning today, this one victory at Ball State makes you win 
the Mac. And that in 20 years, I would say this, that as a player and a coach, I don't give up. I don't allow our players to give up. And that's kind of what happened yesterday. We could have easily given up 0-9. We just gave up a big lead in the ninth, and we, we didn't. We didn't. I thought it was a great sign. Uh, there's a lot of rain in the forecast this week, really, from Wednesday on. Um, how does that that threat of, of having um, some games this weekend get washed out affect the preparation? It wasn't the level of nausea that the three-run home run in the ninth inning yesterday caused me, but I've already talked to uh, Coach Eric Roof at Eastern Michigan this morning. That's why I was about a minute late jumping on here. And just asked him if we can get the MAC to approve he and I coordinating some flexibility with the closeness of both parks that if it, if it comes down to if logistically we can get vans or buses or whatever, if we could play two here and two there or back and forth. And, and he was extremely gracious to that thought and idea. But Colin, we're going to go down to the field tomorrow and practice. We're going to put the tarp out. We'll have to see what winter rodents decided to do some damage. We'll, we'll patch the tarp in areas that we need to. And we'll just hope the forecast keeps changing so that we can play at home. It'll be our, it'll be our first home game uh, since the Ohio series in 2019. So to say that we're anxious to play at Himes would be a, an understatement. Coach, you got a pretty hot hitter in Ethan Ladukovic. What's been the key to his success so far? You know, we didn't have him yesterday, Robin. I don't know if you guys saw that too. He's got a strained calf and I'm just going, wow, when is this going to, you know, when is this going to settle in where we have all of our guys? <clears throat> but I, I think, Robin, you've seen, you've called so many games and, and so many different sports. It's a very calm, very mature veteran um, leadership quality individual. He doesn't get too caught up in it. He's become very patient. I'd be remiss if I didn't give our hitting coach, Adam Petrovics, a lot of credit. Uh, he was actually, um, uh, he's struggling, you know, I mean, he's, the offense has not done what, what he thought, and he's kind of stayed the course, but he's done an exceptional job with Ethan, and um, Ethan's a young man that it's, it's just really easy to respect him and how he goes about his business. He's, he's got a job offer already next year with KPMG over in Detroit as an accountant. Uh, he's, he's a very bright young man. And I think all of those characteristic, Robin, they come to play in the box. And it's just a one pitch at a time approach for him. And then, Sean, you mentioned his home run yesterday, but he's got some crazy power there. Uh, what do you see in his future? That's hard to say. I mean, he has uh, physically gotten his body in as good a shape of anybody that we've ever coached. He's a physical specimen. He's a, he's a, I would say, a plus defensive first baseman. He, you, you go back to Hunter Prince in 2016, Robin, when you look at that team that was 11th in the nation in defense, although the left side of the infield with Grant Miller and Connor Smith were very good, Hunter Prince cleaned up a lot of their stuff that came over. And, and Sean O'Keefe does the same thing. Uh, Ethan Hadukovic is a very good first baseman too, but Sean's, Sean's outstanding defensively. He's got some serious power. I don't know. I think as the season plays out for him, maybe there's something afterwards for him, but I tell you what, he's menacing. He was intentionally walked several times this weekend. I thought they were good decisions to walk him, uh, and then they didn't. And uh, when he didn't, he has stepped up. And he has really been really one of the more consistent guys for us in the lineup with some clutch RBIs. And, and um, we're excited to have him in the middle of our lineup, healthy and playing first base, that's for sure. And then you lose a guy like Dunn, and you put in a kid, Will Morrison, who I think is going to be a great one here at Western Michigan. Is center field his spot, or where do you see him? I think he earned a spot in your lineup the rest of the season, or at least the, this weekend. Anyway, <laughs> he's a good player from a historic high school program there at Gross Point Liggett. No question about it, Robin. And when we recruited him, I, I thought he would be an impact player as a freshman, and the kid's been riddled with injuries. 
uh, Achilles, you know, he dislocated his knee at Kansas State. Uh, he's had some of those uh, injuries that have kind of plagued him throughout his career. Um, he, he has struggled a little bit offensively, but so I think he's the most comfortable in center field, but he's also an extremely versatile defensive outfielder that could go to right field. Uh, you know, and if you have him and Dunn and Charping out there running around, you've got a lot of speed and that could take away a lot of base hits. But in the meantime, until we get Blake Dunn back, and that's, that's a projected late April, maybe early May. Maybe he'll get five MAC weekends. We'll see. But um, I was excited for Will. He competes, Robin. He's a big-time competitor. He has a lot of tools. Uh, he's trying to figure out, you know, he dropped a couple. He got that whole inning started with that drag bunt. And, uh, and then the thing blew up uh, offensively for us. But he made some really tough catches yesterday, Robin. It was a tough sky. It was a very bright blue and a sunny sky. And the outfielders really fought for every out that they made. But I agree with you, Robin. He's got a chance to be a very good player. And I think up until this point, you know, Will Morrison just hasn't been healthy. And then last year it got cut short. and We just didn't really get – get to see much, but he was recruited the same way that you see him. No question about it. Uh, part of the offensive issue, um, it seems like, is, has been strikeouts. Uh, there are 50 uh, of those this weekend for your team. Um, you, you mentioned you faced some, uh, some very good pitching, but, you know, uh, obviously, you know, striking out more than 10 times a game is still problematic. Um, how do you cut those down? Well, you fight, Colin. And if, you, if, you're on the, if you're in a box facing 95 miles an hour, it's just kind of like being on a battlefield. You're going to have to deal with certain injuries, but you don't stop fighting. Um, we, don't, we don't rack up those kind of Ks uh, like yesterday when the frontline guys came out of the game. We didn't strike out at all. Matter of fact, you know, you needed six or seven beagles out there to chase every ball that we were hitting over the fence and in the gaps. Um, and I don't want to belittle our hitters that they can't hit projected first, second, and third round guys. But Keegan Aiken struck out a lot of people here, too. He struck out a lot of good hitters. And um, my experience in the game is that good pitching beats good hitting. But to your point, it is too many strikeouts. Um, what we have to do is continue to preach what we preach, and that is our two-strike approach and our survivability in those two strikes. And that boils down to spoiling pitches that you can't do much with. Exploding sliders just off the plate, fastballs just at the top of the strike zone. Pitches intended to beat you. Uh, pitches intended to make you chase. Um, and our guys, I don't mind a swinging strikeout, Colin. I don't mind if guys are competing and they just get beat. That's like if you play great defense and a guy does a great stutter step or a pullback on you and hits a fadeaway three and the defense was there, you got to tip your hat every now and then. But we, we've got to cut those down, and I won't be surprised moving forward to see those cut down, to be honest with you. Uh, that uh, Wicks kid at Kansas State is a projected top three rounder. The Shawver kid that we saw at Cincinnati is the same way. Left-handed velocity was up to 95. Um, actually, the Shonley kid that threw on Sunday at Cincinnati was up to 96. And we had a few punch outs, but we were able to get rid of him in the third inning because he didn't have the command that the other guys had. Uh, and then the, the McDermott kid Friday night or Saturday was, was up to 95 miles an hour. Uh, and it was just, it's just, threat. it's just difficult velocity to deal with. And he had command with it. Uh, it wasn't the umpire's fault or anything. He just was, he was just dealing. And, um, and it's like Sikorsky. Sikorsky will run some strikeouts up on some guys, and he doesn't have what I would call threatening velocity. But he's 89 to 91 with plus command and a good hard slider and a great approach. And, and they're just part of the game. But I'm not going to belittle the amount of strikeouts. They're concerning to me and they're concerning to Petro as well. We're just going to continue to grind that two strike approach, spoil pitches, make that guy throw more pitches so that if he does get us, he's weakened for the guy that's on deck or it builds his pitch count so that we can get into the bullpen sooner like we did yesterday. 
Coach, I, I mean, if this has been talked about, then my apologies. But Drew Devine has obviously gotten a lot of attention this year just because of his injury and coming back. But, I mean, coming into the season, he had four home runs in his career, and he has three this year. What's kind of been the uh, the the factor in that? And, you know, because when you look at Drew, you don't really think of a huge big-time home run hitter, but he is leading the team right now with three. I think it's uh, to-go burritos is what I think it is. Um, but, no, listen, it's it's kind of going back to Robin's point about Ethan Hadukovic and – Robin, you've watched – I look back at, since I've been here, I think of David Brown, you know, when he played basketball here, what a wily veteran he was. And, and those guys are just – their experience makes them great players because the game slows down for them. And, and they're completely under control. And, and I, I think credit to the weight room. I think Drew is a fierce competitor. You know, he is gangly and wiry, and he doesn't look like that. But physically, he's put together – He's uh, pound for pound. He's very strong. Uh, he's got bat speed. He's frustrated because he's had some swing and miss issues. Uh, and he does, you know, these guys, I, I'll be honest with you, our team is, we like home runs and, and they're important, but, but we want high on base percentage. We want threatening problems. We have team speed. We want to take advantage of ball and dirt reads. We want to, we want to draw walks and get more guys on. So when that home run does come, that it's not a solo shot, you know, that it's a, it's a dagger, kind of like um, the one that they put on us in the ninth and the one that Will Morris delivered in the bottom of the 14th. You usually don't get beat by solo shots. It's usually an error and a walk and some guys are on base and then that big ball come. Robin, you've seen it in football too, where it's, it's, not, it's not the go route to Corey Davis. It was the third and three and the defense got a penalty, you know, and allowed to extend the, the play. And then that gives gives the offense another chance, um, but I, I just it's just you know they say in the big leagues, Nate, when they're evaluating hitters, um, that power is the last thing to come in the development, and I think it's similar to that here. Sometimes you get big, strong, brute strength guys that can hit power because of that. Drew is not that guy, and he's just developed into understanding who he is offensively. And it's, it's pitch selection, too. It's about understanding the count. You know, it's, it, it's this pitch, not this pitch. And, and are you ahead of the count? Or are you behind in the count? And what are you trying to do based on where you are in the count? Is it a hitter's count or is it a pitcher's count? If it's a pitcher's count, either you, you've got this approach and you're looking to punish a mistake. If it's a hitter's account, you, you know, you're looking for a certain pitch. Yeah, as I recall, a couple of those home runs were on two strikes yesterday, if I recall right. But Correct, on O'Keefe. That was a mistake. I mean, it, this guy just made a mistake. You know, in the home run that, that uh, you know, Dane Armersmacher was really good yesterday in the home run that he gave up to uh, put the game, I think it was 11 to 10. That was a changeup called away, and his changeup was so good. And, and I was trying to stay away and off the plate as much as I could that I thought if they had to drive the ball to right, or to right center that the wind was pushing out more to left center that we would have a better chance to keep the ball in the park. And he just hung the pitch. And uh, when I went out, I just asked him, I said, what was that mid thigh or belt? And Greg Budig said, no, that was more navel. And uh, so he let the pitch drift in and, and their kid made us pay. And Sean O'Keefe, you know, you, you make guys pay. You don't want to waste a pitch on O2. That O2 pitch is to set up another pitch. And I think he was trying to bounce a breaking ball on Sean there, and, and he missed, and Sean made him pay. Coach, you talked about Greg Budig. When you told me that you had a freshman, true freshman, going to catch for you, I was a <laughs> good luck. You know, that normally doesn't work out in college baseball, but this kid seems to be finding his way. Yeah, I mean, some underlying things, you know, people look at scores and they just go, hey, you won again, you lost again, or whatever. There's a lot of things going on within our roster. Connor Charping is our number one catcher. And, and Connor is the only catcher I've had in 20 years that's gotten Tommy John surgery. He had that last March. He's close to being able to get back there. He probably could have gone, but Greg caught all four games yesterday, Robin. And he's caught every game so far. And, you know, you've coached. They call that, that, that catcher's gear the tools of ignorance. And uh, he, he gets beat up. He wears pitches. 
does a good job. But, you know, I look back at last year when Connor got hurt, we threw Greg Budig behind the plate at USC and Sikorsky's going out and making his start at USC and Sikorsky gets his first career win with Greg Budig catching in his first career game at USC. So Greg's extremely intelligent, Robin. He's, I hate to tell you, but other than my wife, he's the only person that's smarter than me. Uh, he's a 4.0. I think he does school with one hand tied behind his back. Um, and he, he's very, very cerebral. And he's got, he's extremely flexible. And he's got a very quick arm. We got to get some accuracy taken care of on his throws down to second. But, but he, can, he can cut down a running game pretty well too, Robin. He was a very good uh, two-sport athlete at football and uh, baseball at Plainfield North with Brady Miller and Gavin Doyle and those guys. He's, a, he's an extremely tough kid too, Robin, and you have to be to, you know, to play that position. Let's look ahead to Eastern. You got uh, Coach Roof and the Eagles. Uh, they've had a pretty good start to their season, and that's a legendary name in baseball. And I'm sure Gene's over there working with the Eagles on a volunteer basis too. So. <laughs> they're always a tough out eastern michigan you know they always are robin and, and you know with your son jared and, and the experience that i had with him at michigan state i coached all three of those guys so um i just be blunt man i love those guys you know i spent time in the dugout with them and eric and his brother john i coached them they're they're humble hard-working modest true to the bone baseball guys. And they got that from Gene and Phil Roof, you know, their, their dad and their uncle and their pedigree, their brother, Sean played at Illinois. Uh, their sister was an outstanding softball player at Campbell College. I think she might even be in their hall of fame. Um, they're just special. And then AJ Octor, who uh, pitched in the big leagues was, was on that team when I was at Michigan State too. So I really root for them, but not this weekend. But um, they do a good job. They're high energy guys. It's a group of young guys. They do a good job recruiting. They, they compete and they're knowledgeable educators of the game. So it, it's going to be a difficult series. If we had Easton and Blake on the field, it's going to be a difficult series. So, but I, I look forward to playing them. It, it's always a good battle and it's awkward when you're playing, you know, people that you could consider family members. But, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the series, that's for sure. How's your pitching lining up for the weekend then? Well, we're still, we're day to day with Easton. We don't know where Sikorsky is going to be. And I've been talking to him. You know, my approach is going to be that I don't want him on the mound until he's 100% with that hamstring so that that doesn't nag him through the year. Um, this will be, uh, Robin, to me, it's a marathon season. And it's not a sprint. We just have to keep playing no matter what your record is. You don't know what's going to happen in injuries and you don't know what's going to happen with COVID. And you just have to keep playing. Uh, I'm not going to push a panic button and put Easton back on the mound this weekend unless he tells me that he can pitch without thinking about it and pitch completely pain free, especially a hamstring. Um, but I don't know, after Will Mullen's performance, I'm going to have to give that some consideration. Uh, what I did Friday with the absence of Sikorsky, I didn't really know what to do. And I've just tried to use one word in my program since I've been a head coach and since I've been at Western, and it's trust. It's me trusting players, players trusting me. So I thought, well, I better put my money where my mouth is. And I leaned on uh, Zach Mihalic, and I leaned on Tyler Thorrington, and I leaned on uh, Will Mullen, guys that have been here six and five years, our veterans, and they, they kept the game in control on Friday night. Uh, John Baker's one of the top, top guys in the league, and, and we were in that game, and we lost two to nothing. So that kind of set a tone that we were going to compete. So I may look to lean on Will Mullen, Robin. Obviously, Miller will be in that rotation. Um, the Heisman, obviously, will be in the rotation. He had a, a very good start again. And then I'm just going to kind of see where Easton is. Um, I may run Berg back out there again. I don't know. I don't know yet. I'm going to wait and see and, and see how, what the report is with Easton. If it's Easton, 
will probably go uh, Sikorsky, Miller, and maybe Mullen, and then Heisman on Sunday, possibly. I may push Mullen back to Sunday the way that he recovers so that he might be able to save a game. But, you know, I think I just ought to say this, Robin, I'm going to look to win the game. And if it means throwing Jack Heisman in relief on Friday to win that game, I'm going to win that game. And then I'm going to worry about winning game two more than I am laying out what our rotation is. So I think what we'll do is I'll go Friday starter, Robin Hook, the rest of the weekend, TBA. <laughs> I, I like it. You'll be wanting to know then. I know that. <laughs> right. like, hey, I know we're kind of going long here, but there's a lot to talk about. These seven inning double headers and turning three game series into four game weekends. Wow, that's got to be tough on your pitching. Uh, and, and that's only the first weekend, coach. I mean, <laughs> they get this every weekend, these four game series. Wow. Well, it is tough. Our coaches unanimously voted for this because uh, we thought we would only be allowed to play conference games only. We wanted to assure that we at least had 40 games. Things have changed. But I will tell you, Robin, you know, when, when Coach Decker was here, it was two sevens and two sevens. I think it was Saturday, Sunday. Um, uh, I think the Big Ten used to be nine, two sevens and a nine. That's what we are right now. But the fact that we don't have any midweek games and most MAC schools don't, it allows for a lot of recovery time. So it's not as taxing as you would think, but it does make for some long days. And, and then the coaches unanimously agreed, reluctantly but unanimously, to build in uh, run rules. So a nine inning game is 10 runs after seven. And then a seven inning game is 12 runs after five. And that's to keep though, if a, if a team is hit with COVID or whatever, that's just to keep the games from getting out of hand and turning in. Because some of our parks in the league, when the wind's blowing out, you've seen them, but boy, they, it can turn into, there's some ugly scores in our league sometimes. And we just thought with everything that was going on, to not let guys' emotion get involved in some lopsided ball games. I think it was a prudent decision by our coaching staff. I don't see that happening going forward, but I think this year with COVID, I think it was a good decision by our, by our coaching staff in our league. It's four game series are also very tough on the SID as well. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you know about Eastern Michigan? their players, their pitching staff, coach? They're like a lot of teams, Robin. You know, when you look at the preseason picks, uh, I don't think there's anybody in the league that can't win it. And I've never thought that. But I think that 12 – I think I feel like all 11 teams, if they get playing right, could win it. And Eastern is a lot like us. You know, they've got Davis Feldman over there. They run out on Friday night. I think he's been around longer than Mullen. And I feel like Mullen's been here 17 years. Um, so these guys have veterans on their clubs. Um, their, their offensive lineup, I feel like I've been seeing these guys for three or four years. Uh, when I look at their starting lineup with the Jones brothers and Timco and some other guys, I mean, it's just – four, five, and six-year players, but it's the same at Northern Illinois. It's the same at Ball State. It's the same at Kent. It's the same at Miami. It's the same at Western. So it's just a bunch of old guys out trying to knock each other out. And, and they're going to be menacing because, like we talked about with Hadukovic and Devine, you know, you've been around four or five years. You're, you're just better in the box. You've got more experience, and, and you become more difficult out. But they're going to have to deal with that on our side, too. Anything else, Coach? Okay. No, I just – if this is going to be posted, I, it's just another quick message just to my team, you know, because the emotion was – we were full of, of elation yesterday to win that game and to win the game like we did. But our, our guys understand – if COVID has taught all of us anything, is that you cannot go around any – you can't go around it. You have to go right through the middle of it. And – and adversity, like our start, where we, we haven't played horrible, and we've been involved in four one-run games, and we've lost them, a couple of two-run games, and we've lost them. Now an extra inning game and just a, a battle like a battle of the ages to win that. 
I'm so proud of the team that I'm coaching, the way that they fought yesterday and the way that they never gave up and the way that they made plays when the game was on the line and that they didn't focus on the failure that happens in our game over and over and that they kept pushing and surging. I was like, goosebumps. I was just overwhelmed with pride and gratefulness to watch the Western Michigan baseball team compete like they did yesterday. And they have all year. They haven't given up, but yesterday was something very special for me. So if our guys are watching this, my hat to you guys. What a special day. We'll see if that uh, kind of jumps